I don't believe I've ever conducted an ensemble that didn't have uh, at least a few musicians who were struggling with the kind of issues that really define me too. And uh, from my time in the Marine Band, um, right through my time as director of bands at Butler University, I was often dealing with musicians and of course at Butler with students who were struggling with these various kinds of conditions, these various di diagnoses, and looking for ways to participate in a large ensemble. Welcome to the Vermont Conversation. I'm David Goodman. When Michael Colburn was growing up in St. Albans, he dreamed of becoming a euphonium player in a band. He never imagined that the band would be the president's own United States Marine Band, which he ended up leading for a decade. As director of the nation's top military ensemble, Colburn served as music advisor to the White House and regularly conducted the Marine Band and Chamber Orchestra at the Executive Mansion and at the presidential inaugurations of George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Colburn has returned to Vermont to lead a very different kind of ensemble. He is taking the baton to lead the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington, which describes itself as the world's only classical music organization created for individuals with mental illness and the people who support them. The orchestra was founded in 2011 by conductor Ronald Braunstein, the first American to win the prestigious Karyon International Conducting Competition in Berlin in 1979. Braunstein was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and had to abandon his international conducting career. But he and Caroline Widden, his wife and the executive director of the Me Too Orchestra, have created a stigma-free musical home for others with mental illness. Me Too is the subject of a PBS documentary and numerous press articles. The Me Too Orchestra now has a Boston ensemble, which Braunstein still conducts, but Colburn will now lead the Burlington Orchestra. I began by asking Mike Colburn why he wanted to lead the Me Too Orchestra. Well, uh, Me Too is a group that, honestly, I knew nothing about until a few months ago. Uh, I was sitting in my office at Butler University. My previous position was director of bands at Butler. And I was reading the Burlington Free Press and came across a story about how they were searching for a conductor for this orchestra. And uh, was very curious, knowing that I was going to be moving back to Vermont in a few months and uh, looking for opportunities to reconnect with the Vermont musical scene. I started doing a little research and was really impressed with the mission of this orchestra, which was founded by Ronald Brownstein, um, a conductor who is probably well known to, to many of your readers. Um, uh, really fantastically uh, talented conductor whose career was uh, hampered by his own diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, and this led Ronald to decide that he needed to start an organization for people, as he said, like him. Um, and the more people that he talked to about his own situation, the, the more often he heard the answer, well, me too, me too, which is where the name of the organization uh, came from. And so it is an organization that was designed to allow for musicians with diagnoses like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, other kinds of conditions. Also musicians who struggle with uh, substance abuse, dependency issues, a, a number of other issues that might otherwise hamper their ability to share their talents with other, others in a large scale organization like an orchestra or a band. And so it's not that there's a requirement that our members uh, have one of these diagnoses. Many of our members, in fact, are there simply because they want to support the idea, support the cause of making music in an ensemble like this that really welcomes all musicians without fear of being judged. Um, and, uh, and with the idea that music, of course, can be uh, an avenue of of, uh, of healing and, and a great resource for many who are struggling with mental issues. You have had a storied career leading uh, bands, most notably the Marine Band. Um, what spoke to you about this mission? This is an orchestra, an ensemble, unlike any other that you've led. That is true, although I will uh, have to say, and I, I made this point to Caroline Whitten, who is the uh, executive director of, of uh, the Me Too organization. When I was talking to her about this position, 
um, that I don't believe I've ever conducted an ensemble that didn't have uh, at least a few musicians who were struggling with the kind of issues that really define me too. And uh, from my time in the Marine Band, uh, right through my time as director of bands at Butler University, I was often dealing with musicians and of course at Butler with students who were struggling with these various kinds of conditions, these various di diagnoses and looking for ways to participate in, in large ensembles. Um, and it's always been a personal goal of mine to do whatever I could to facilitate those musicians for making, you know, uh, enabling them to make music with others in ensembles like the United States Marine Band uh, and our chamber orchestra and with our ensembles at Butler as well. Um, in some cases, there were impediments that we were not able to overcome, but I'm very happy to say in many cases that we were able to work very creatively with, with those musicians and find ways for them to participate with their peers. Can you give me an example of kind of creative accommodations that you've come up with in the past? Sure. Um, I'll start most recently with my time at Butler. Um, we had a, uh, a horn player who um, was on the autism spectrum, uh, um, fairly high functioning, but still uh, a student who had some challenges, was prone to uh, verbal outbursts and, and uh, had problems just kind of controlling his emotions and, and uh, his ability to kind of, you know, quietly participate in an ensemble setting, uh, such as a, as a band rehearsal or a performance. And it was really remarkable to see how this young man progressed during his four years at Butler. First and foremost, and this really just did my heart uh, so much good to see the support from his fellow students. There was no judgment. Uh, the students quickly understood that they were dealing with a very intelligent, very talented musician who was just struggling with this disorder, which um, which did uh, occasionally result, as I said, in an in, in outburst that could be very disruptive to a, to a rehearsal. Um, but through uh, a series of, of situations where we provided uh, feedback that was constructively critical, that was kind and supportive. Uh, this young man knew that we were all there with him along the way, cheering him on and supporting him and was able to adjust his own behavior, you know, really through just a series of uh, experiences and dealing with rehearsals, learning how to read certain verbal and physical cues to understand when his behavior was just not what um, was going to help us to have a productive rehearsal. And so to watch that kind of progression and to see the support that he enjoyed from his peers uh, was really, really quite remarkable. Um, during my time in the Marine Band, we uh, had uh, a, a number of situations that arose, uh, a few that really um, I remember very clearly of uh, musicians who struggled with focal dystonia, which is a, a condition that uh, exists somewhere between the physical and psychological realm. They're still kind of determining exactly what causes focal dystonia. Uh, and the symptoms really can vary depending on what uh, the musician does to make a living. So there are examples of of pianists with focal dystonia who lose control over their, their uh, dexterity. Um, for brass players, often it's the embouchure, it's the set of muscles right around um, uh, the mouthpiece that just stop functioning. And they're still you know, trying to figure out exactly what causes this. Um, there are a number of, of teachers and counselors and therapists that specialize in focal dystonia. And so we were able to send our musicians to go work with these kind of coaches to help them to, to overcome these situations. In some cases, those stories had a happy ending. In other cases, unfortunately, the, the, the conditions um, worsened and or just, you know, did not improve. But I'm happy to say that in many cases, we were able to help those musicians through those periods of struggle and difficulty and able to help them and help to support them as they recovered those set of skills that got them into the Marine Band to begin with. Hmm. Talk about growing up as a musician in St. Albans, Vermont, not a place known for turning out professional musicians who go on to tour the world as you have. Well, it was in many ways uh, a, an idyllic place to grow up. Um, you know, I, I uh, love Vermont. I love St. Albans. Our, my, my wife and I are both from St. Albans. My father was the high school band director there for many, many years. Vern Colburn, who's a, that's a name that may be familiar to some of your readers, uh, who was not only a high school band director at, at Bellows Free Academy at BFA, 
but also was the director of the 40th Army National Guard Band for many, many years. Um, and was also a very talented piano player who played in many uh, uh, restaurants and bars and, and other kind of uh, nightlife scenes throughout Northern Vermont for many years. So in many ways, he was kind of the Mr. Music. He was the music man of, of St. Albans. You know, it seems like all musical roads led through him. Um, and he really built up an incredible program at BFA. Uh, you know, uh, St. Albans is in Franklin County. It's a very agricultural part of the state. You know, in a very agricultural state, Franklin County is really one of the, uh, is in many ways, especially with uh, dairy farming and the, and the maple syrup industry is really uh, a very agricultural part of the state. So as you said, not necessarily known for uh, generating um, a, a lot of artists, although I will have to say I am certainly not the only musician who emanates from St. Albans. Um, very good friend of mine and one of my father's prize students is a gentleman by the name of David Rakowski, who is now on the faculty at Brandeis University. He's a, a composer and a composition teacher, a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and really just a, an incredible uh, uh, musical mind and, and intellect. Uh, he hails from St. Albans as well. A number of other uh, musicians who have gone on to professional and semi-professional careers. So in spite of the fact that there isn't uh, what many people would perce perceive to be a thriving cultural art scene there in St. Albans and in Franklin County, very proud of the fact that we have uh, generated a number of very, very talented musicians. What was your route to the president's own Marine band? I know that you're a euphonium player, and rather than me uh, mischaracterize the euphonium, I'm going to let you describe it to people who aren't familiar with it. Sure. So the, 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 the easiest shorthand description of the euphonium is uh, a baby tuba. In fact, uh, in some countries, it's known as the tenor tuba because it looks very much like a tuba, but about half the size. So it plays in the same register as a trombone. Um, and in many uh, people's minds, it's basically the equivalent of, of what the cello is in the orchestra. That's what the euphonium is to the band. Um, so I uh, originally wanted to play tuba. My big brother was a tuba player, and I still have fond memories. One of Some of my earliest memories were actually when I was a toddler, and I would sneak into his room where he kept his sousaphone and would crawl up, up, up inside the instrument, literally, so I could blow uh, into the mouthpiece and make this really big, powerful sound, which I just found to be really uh, exciting, you know. But when I was in fifth grade and it was time to choose instruments, my father recommended uh, the euphonium, which is also known as the baritone horn. Uh, because he said, you know, it's very much like a small tuba. It'll be easier for you to carry around and to start with, you know, at your size, especially. And then when you get a little bit bigger, you can switch to the tuba. But um, when I was in junior high, I, I had the very good fortune of my, my uh, one of my earliest band directors was a bass trombone player, a low brass player himself. And so uh, a gentleman by the name of Randy Wheeler, who, who taught at uh, Georgia School for many, many years, and uh, under Randy's tutelage, I learned not only the baritone, but also trombone and tuba in junior high. But there was something about the euphonium that I just fell in love with. I just loved the, the sound of the instrument and the fact that it was a little unusual was kind of appealing to me as well. And when I was in junior high, I attended a, a summer brass camp at the uh, University of Vermont. And one of the visiting faculty was the principal euphonium in the United States Marine Band, the president's own, uh, a gentleman by the name of Lucas Spiros. And that was the first professional euphonium player I ever met. And it's, it's the first time I even knew there was such a thing as a professional euphonium player. And I won't say that that's where I decided on the spot, that's what I wanted to do, but that's really where the seed was planted. And so as I made my way through high school and explored the various interests that I had, um, and it became more and more clear to me that that music was kind of calling to me as a career and not just um, as a career, but really with the hopes of being a performer that I started to think about playing in, um, in a military band. Uh, of course, I always hoped it would be the president's own United States Marine Band, but I would have been thrilled to to get a career, have a career with any of the, the bands in D.C. in particular, those premier military bands in Washington, D.C. So when uh, it came time to go to college, I wrote to all the principal euphonium players in the military bands to ask their recommendations of who to study with. And a name that showed up on everybody's list was uh, Daniel Parentoni, who taught tuba and euphonium uh, back in those days at Arizona State University. So uh, I applied, was accepted to go out there and study on scholarship with Dan. 
And it was really a life-changing experience. Uh, Mr. Parentoni really uh, kind of rebuilt me as a musician, not just as a euphonium player, but, but really kind of retaught me how to make music on this instrument that I love so much. And um, so I studied with him for three years, uh, still waiting for an audition. I mean, one of the things about these uh, premier military band auditions is that you just never know when a vacancy is going to occur and, and when an opportunity might arise. So I was in my third year of study with Mr. Parentoni when finally there was an audition for the Marine Band. Uh, that was just the first band that opened up, which I was, of course, very excited about. And um, uh, found out when I arrived for the audition that they were looking for not one, but two euphonium players. So I thought, whoa, I, I just doubled my chances, right? Well, guess who came in third at that audition? Uh, I missed <laughs> By that much, as uh, as Maxwell Smart used to say, um, and I thought, well, that may have been my only opportunity to ever land one of these jobs. And so I went back to school and started thinking about what Plan B was going to be. And about a month later, I got a call from the Marine Band, uh, and they were letting me know that they had decided to add another position to the section and wanted to know if I was still interested. Hmm. So you can imagine what my answer was. And so at the end of that academic year, my wife and I, Nancy, uh, who's also from Vermont, as I mentioned, uh, packed up our goods in Arizona and moved all the way over to across the country to Washington, D.C. and began a 20 year, 27 year adventure that I still can't really believe happened. So uh, this would be a good point to ask you, what is the president's own U.S. Marine Band? And also this whole uh, history of music in the military. It's not what people think. Um, and, and another question, if I may stack a few up here, um, do the musicians in the band have to go through a boot camp? Sure, so there are several questions there that I'll tackle here one at a time. Um, we are called the President's Own because our mission is to provide music for the White House. So there are many things that are distinctive about the U.S. Marine Band, one of which is that we're the only uh, band to be founded by an act of Congress. We were founded back in 1798 uh, by an act of Congress when John Adams was president, so he signed off on this act. And in fact, we have played for every president except for George Washington. Uh, the first inauguration that we played was for Thomas Jefferson in 1801, and we have played for every inauguration since then. Um, in this country, a lot of people think, you know, that old in America isn't really that old compared to the rest of the world. And that is certainly true in a general sense. But I will say that the Marine Band is actually older than several European musical institutions. We're older than the Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic. We're older than the Berlin Philharmonic. We really are uh, an historic musical organization. Uh, you asked about military music and military music, of course, uh, as we know it, it really has its roots in Europe, uh, certainly with Asian influences, uh, especially from the Turkish culture. But uh, from the earliest days of, of uh, the military, of standing militaries in Europe, there was an understanding and an appreciation for having musical units, of course, for recruiting purposes, first and foremost, but also for entertaining the troops and entertaining the public. Uh, even in those early days, um, the, the, the general officers or their equivalents in these, uh, in these militaries understood the, the need for public relations and understood that, that these military musical units were a great way to interface and interact with the public. And that certainly is what bands like the Marine Band do um, in this country to this day. You know, there's, there's really no a quicker way to the heart than through music. And you, if you want to stir feelings of patriotism and nationalism in people, doing that through music is really one of the most effective means that, that I certainly have encountered. Um, as I mentioned, the president's own, our, our mission is to provide music for the White House. Now, we certainly do a lot of public events, you know, in, in addition to that, and do events, of course, on behalf of the Marine Corps. One of our most important jobs in the president's own is providing full honors funerals at Arlington National Cemetery for, for fallen Marines, either active duty Marines or Marine veterans. Um, and that is uh, a part of our responsibility that we take very seriously. Um, we uh, love taking the band on tour, going you know all around our country. We we go on the on the road for a month or two every every fall and and try to make sure that over the course of a five year period, we've hit pretty much every nook and cranny of our country. And um, there's really nothing more stirring than you know playing a, a, a concert for one of those tour audiences. 
and seeing a grizzled old Marine Corps veteran, you know, in a wheelchair struggling to get to his feet when he hears the Marines him, because in his mind or her mind, it would be disrespectful to not stand at attention when hearing the Marines him, you know, and, and seeing that over and over and over again, um, it never got old. I mean, every time I saw it, I just felt like I was seeing it for the first time. And then that opportunity, of course, to provide music for the White House, you know, um, to provide music not only for the presidents, but for their assembled guests and never really knowing who was gonna be there at the White House when we were performing. I remember um, one time there, I was there with our chamber orchestra. A lot of people are, are surprised to find out the Marine Band has a chamber orchestra and about a, a third of my conducting was with that group. Um, I remember one time uh, conducting the theme from Schindler's List and we finished up and I heard a little smattering of applause and I turned around and it was Steven Spielberg and John Williams mm. who had been in the receiving line and were so touched that we were playing their music that they felt they had to come out and, and thank us and applaud for us. And I just had so many of those kinds of experiences over the years that uh, it really, um, it was a great reminder, you know, to, um, to always sound our best, regardless of how many people, you know, seem to be listening, because we just never knew who was in the next room listening very closely indeed. And did you go through boot camp? So um, there are many things that are distinctive about the president's own, as I mentioned, and one of them is that we do not require our Marines to go through recruit training. This was a decision that was made by the Commandant back in the 1950s. Uh, and it was made for a couple of reasons, but primarily because our Marines cannot be transferred anywhere else in the Marine Corps. So if you win a position in the president's own, it's what the military calls a permanent duty station. So for example, I spent my entire 27 years in the Marine Corps attached to the president's own United States Marine Band at Marine Barracks 8th and I in Washington, DC. And the only responsibilities that our Marines have are musical responsibilities. So there really is no need or requirement for them to undergo uh, weapons training or the other kind of training that they would receive in recruit training. Um, and so when the Commandant realized that, and of course, you know, figuring also in the, the, the risk of physical injury that might be incurred by our Marines receiving this training, but most especially because it was not training that was really required for their career in the Marine Corps, he decided that it was really unnecessary. So when you win a position with the President's Own, you report for duty directly to Marine Barracks 8th and I, and you receive about a month's worth of military training from one of our drum majors who has gone to recruit training. So our Marines are fully trained in the customs and courtesies, all the rules and regulations, uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, all those things that any good Marine needs to know, our, our Marines receive that training when they report for duty in Washington, DC. Is that unique to the Marine Corps band? Are the musicians in other services just regular service members? That is unique to the president's own United States Marine Band. There is no other military band in the Marine Corps or in other services that uh, that has that exemption. Hmm. You've described uh, another one of your the jobs of the president's own uh, Marine Band is playing at presidential inaugurations. And you've described playing at President Obama's inauguration as historic. I'm wondering if you could um, say what you mean and what that experience was like. Sure. Um, so in addition to being an avid student uh, and lover of music, as you might imagine from somebody in my profession, I'm also a, a very avid student of history. So I felt so fortunate in many ways to, to land in a job like the Marine Band. First as a player, I joined the band as a euphonium player, as I mentioned, and did that for nine years. And then became, um, uh, I was commissioned an officer, became an assistant director. Uh, so at that point began conducting our musicians. And then I was director from 2004 to 2014. And every time I was at a, a public event in Washington, D.C., especially those events that were associated with the White House, with the Capitol, with um, the various monuments around Washington, D.C., all of which the Marine Band was actually there um, uh, at, the, at basically the groundbreaking ceremonies, um, it was a reminder that that we were really part of the fabric of history in Washington, DC. So every time we did an inauguration, I couldn't help but think of all the Marine Corps musicians who had gone before me and done exactly the same job, you know, played Four Ruffles and Flourishes, Hail to the Chief, you know, had played the Stars and Stripes Forever, had played, of course, our national anthem. 
thinking of all the Marine musicians who had done that before I did it, it really is kind of awe-inspiring. Uh, you know, the most famous Marine Corps musician, of course, is John Philip Sousa himself, who was our 17th director. He led the Marine Band from 1880 to 1892. And to have the job that John Philip Sousa once had, it's a little daunting, I got to tell you, you know? <laughs> so I would try not to think about it too much, but but would kind of remind myself of the responsibility that that, that position entailed. So every inauguration was really meaningful, very special, always felt very privileged to, to be taking part. But I will tell you that when you're in the middle of that event, you don't want to allow yourself to think too much about the history, to think too much about the, the, the larger perspective. I was very focused on making sure the band hit all of its cues, that we played everything you know at the right time, the right length, all the timing worked out. So you're really focused on that task at hand. And for President Obama's uh, inauguration, um, that was very much the case. And the very last thing that happened at the swearing in ceremony, which the Marine Band plays for in addition to marching in the parade, um, the very last thing that happened was the Navy Sea Chanters, the, the vocal group for the Navy Band was singing the national anthem, a cappella. And since we had no role in that, I turned around to face out toward the mall, which is where the national colors were and, and saluted during the anthem. And that was the first time that I'd really allowed myself to look out on that incredible crowd that was there that day, the largest ever assembled for a presidential inauguration. And to really think about the import of this event, to just to think of the historical magnitude, right? The first African-American president, you know, elected in our country and to see the incredible outpouring of support for that event and to realize that we were playing this very small, I, I want to quickly point out it's a very small role, but still that we had a role in that event and were again part of just the incredible, uh, the, the, the rich tapestry of history that our country enjoys. And having myself been at that inauguration, I know you were had following in some big musical steps. I uh, heard uh, Bruce Springsteen and Pete Seeger lead a concert the night before on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. So um, it was quite a musical as well as historic experience, that uh, event. Well, just uh, circling back to where we started, um, this rich musical career that you have had, what do you think will help you most or what do you look forward to bringing to the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington? Well, uh, first and foremost, from a um, uh, purely musical perspective, I'm excited to be working with an orchestra again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, about a third of my conducting with the Marine Band was with our chamber orchestra, either at the White House or at public concerts uh, around town. And while I was at Butler University, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I was there for eight years and had a chance to work with uh, the, the students and faculty there, but largely in concert band settings. And I, and I love the band, you know, I'm a euphonium player. Euphoniums exist primarily to play in bands, but I was uh, really thrilled that my Marine band career gave me the opportunity to explore orchestral repertoire. And uh, of course, as much as I love the band, we can't really compete with the incredible wealth of repertoire that the orchestra enjoys. So having a chance to kind of dip my toe back into that larger body of repertoire to work with string players, which I think um, really every, every band conductor should look for an opportunity to conduct orchestras and work with string players because it just really in many ways completes you as a musician and as a conductor. So I'm really excited about that. But then also embracing this mission that Me Too has of, of, um, of not uh, judging musicians um, based on whatever various diagnoses, conditions, or situations they may find themselves in, but looking for opportunities to allow them to pursue their musical goals as part of a larger ensemble. Um, and one of my earliest conversations with Caroline about the mission of Me Too, I told her that in many ways it kind of reminded me of the mission of every community group I've ever played in. I, I uh, have played and continue to play in our Citizens Concert Band in St. Albans. I, it's something I started doing back when I was in junior high and I was sitting next to a 70-something a euphonium player. You know, We had nothing in common other than the fact that we both love to play baritone and, and euphonium. And I learned so much from him from that experience. And uh, every community group I've ever 
worked with, it's been about people showing up with their instrument, doing the best job they can, and 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 nobody stands in judgment. Nobody worries about who's playing what chair or, or you know, uh, what their salary is compared to the person sitting next to them. They're just there because they love to make music. And to me, that very much is consistent with the mission of Me Too. So I'm really looking forward to uh, exploring music in, in this, this new environment. Well, Mike Colburn, I want to thank you for joining us on the Vermont Conversation. Thank you so much, David. It's been a pleasure.